to start off, today we're going to continue where we left off last week. We're looking at slide okay. 23 of this set of notes. Study okay. number 4 is focusing on the practice of underwriting. So when we see that word underwriting, we need to think about something. What are we looking at there? Oh, can you hold on just a second for me, please? Sure. One minute, one minute. No problem. Underwriting, um... Uh, no, there's the one word. Uh, Underwriting. We spoke about Lloyd's of London. That was part of one of the role players last week. Uh, we looked at Lloyd's and their role as the underwriter. So when we talk about underwriting, what is the focus? Uh, it's about the insurable risk. Correct. Okay, the it's specialist. About Yes, it's about establishing insurable risk. Is the risk insurable or is it measurable? Is it something that someone is going to be willing to take on as a risk? And the insurer needs to have an underwriting process in place to help establish the loss that could arise. Okay, so there's a few concepts here that we need to look at in, in some detail because they are important from an exam point of view. For example, if I look at the learning outcomes, these three are always asked about somewhere in your exam. They talk about indemnity, they talk about contribution and subrogation. Okay, so we'll define what they are and we'll discuss what they are in more detail. But just to highlight one or two things that are key uh, because they're common when looking at um, older assignments and, and past papers. So when looking at underwriting, you said we're establishing risk. That's the first yep. step. When looking at covering risk, okay, we then need to look at contribution, okay, because that's something that looks at the actual cover. Okay. Okay, we'll discuss that in more detail. Right, so right. cover is, is the protection that we have for those negative things arising, right? Okay. Okay, so if I'm in an accident, you'll have cover because you've got car insurance that will pay for the damages. But now mm -hmm. we need to look at who actually pays for that um, that repair, okay, all the damages that need to be fixed. And there could be contribution that could apply there potentially. We'll look at indemnity, we'll discuss what that is. We'll also look at things like the principle of good faith, okay, so obviously remember we said when looking at insurance, the insurance yes. industry is based on trust and yes. how much we trust our providers. So okay. you're paying someone for mm -hmm. your insecurity around um, a certain event from arising. Okay, so if we're worried that we're going to be in a car accident, mm -hmm. we're going to take out car insurance, right? Yes. Because we're insecure about not having enough funds available to repair the vehicle, or maybe the vehicle's completely wrecked and we won't be able to replace it. So mm -hmm. because it's based on our... Um, remember, it's our insecurities. Like we saw some of, the, some of those examples. Remember that South African actress, she, mm -hmm. she, um, she took out insurance against her hair not growing back because she had to shave all her hair off. Yes. Things like that. That's people's insecurity. So because she thought she wasn't going to grow her hair back, she took out insurance against that event occurring. So if, if it was true, if she didn't grow her hair back, then there would have been some sort of compensation for that risk or that event. Okay. And that's why we need to have this principle when it comes to insurance contracts. There needs to be a principle of good faith. Okay, because what was stopping that lady from keep shaving her head? So let's say she just kept shaving her head every single day, so no one actually saw her hair grow back. Then that wouldn't be in good faith because now she's trying to perhaps claim against the insurance contract for her hair not growing back, but in actual fact, her hair is growing back, but she's just choosing to keep cutting it off. Okay. All right, so that's the principle of good faith. We'll discuss that in more detail. Just remember it's based on trust. You're okay. trusting your provider to give you cover when certain bad things occur. Okay. Right, and that's why some, that's why some insurance companies either have a really good reputation or a really bad reputation. So if you think about insurance companies, you've probably seen a lot of those ads. They, they advertise yep. all sorts of things. They advertise from funeral cover to 
life insurance to disability to all of that stuff and sometimes they even play them on tv sometimes they play it um during like um different um like videos and that online and stuff like that, that you can actually see and and what are they always trying to promote what do insurance companies always promote uh, it would be their name yes it, their name their, actual health. their yeah. profile their reputation exactly yeah. because that's all the insurer has is their ability to provide what they say they're going to provide and it's based on trust and that's why they need to be very careful with the process of underwriting because they can't accept everyone on their books because some people might be too high risk and if that's the case that's going to put everyone else at risk yes. uh, when when making claims um, for certain let's say losses okay so if you knew let's say uh, let's say you knew you had a, a, a critical illness okay and you wanted to take out cover for it yes would the underwriter or would the insurer rather okay because the insurer will be giving you the product would they be more or less inclined to take you on as a client there would be less because they you would. have you're right okay and why high risk you'd be high risk because exactly. you have an illness exactly yeah. and, and that's something that we'll look at as well in terms of um, adverse selection okay adverse okay. selection is when someone who is in a let's say uh, a bad situation for example like that so you know you've got a critical il illness okay maybe you've got cancer right and you you want to take out cover for that specifically um, and you leave it right until the end okay so only once the cancer has progressed to more life-threatening do you now choose to take out um, insurance okay that creates a problem for the insurer because the insurer doesn't only want people um, to take out insurance when they need it they want people to take out insurance earlier okay okay so think about it you don't uh, you can't it'll be great if we could take out insurance only when we're in an accident <laughs> That would be good. <laughs> but is that possible? No, it's not. No, because it's a risk for the insurer. Okay, because it's probabilities. Right, remember, it's the pooling of funds that allows the insurer to cover certain damages for certain individuals because it's actually compensated by others. Okay, okay. it's many contributing, but only a few get getting paid out. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll look at what a premium is, we'll talk about a short-term policy, and we'll look at some essentials and non-essential terms as well in this particular section. Right, first bit is what is underwriting. I think you, de you define it quite well, but it's more than just the risk or establishing the risk. Can you, can you take it a bit further? Can you explain it a bit more? Okay, uh, they are the specialists. They identify risks and uh, estimates and they measure the risk That's awesome, great. Okay, so estimate is key, right? Because they're the specialists, as you said. Okay, it's a very good use of um, descriptions there. You're describing them very well in terms of what their role is. You also said measuring, that's also key. Okay, so underwriters are also there to measure and to determine the amount of loss that could be sustained when a particular event occurs. Okay, and is this, is underwriting insurance? Uh, no, it's not. No, underwriting is a process that assists with the insurance industry or, or the risk management. Okay, it's, it's there to help define what the problem areas are or what the problems are um, in order to then make a decision on what we should or, or shouldn't do. Okay, are we willing to self-fund it or uh, maybe even non-insurance? Okay, we just, we just live with the risks and we're not going to worry about it. Okay. Okay, so those are the three definitions. Very important definitions. As I said earlier, these are three that come up often. Okay, they look at indemnity, they look at contribution, and they look at subrogation. Right, so to define each of them, I've tried to summarize each of them in, in one sentence. Okay, so if I read out the sentence that I've written for the first one, okay, indemnity is the insured is put back in the financial position he or she was in prior to the loss. Okay, so when we talk about indemnity or indemnify, okay, we're looking at trying to create a scenario where you haven't lost anything because you've been put back in the position you were before. Right, so can you, can you be enriched? Is there enrichment there? 
No. There can't be. Okay, so no one should ever come out better than they were before when looking at indemnity. Okay, so for example, um, vehicle insurance. Right, they're fixing the vehicle, or if they replace the vehicle, they replace the vehicle at that particular cost. So you get a vehicle that's the same sort of make and model and year as what you've had it um, covered for. Right, so the, the concept in insurance is no one should be looking at insurance as a way to profit or a way to generate a return. That's not its objective. Remember, the objective of insurance is to provide peace of mind that when certain negative events arise, there's cover for those events so that we don't ever have a situation where we're worse off than how we were before, but also we're never in a situation where we're better off um, than what we were before. Okay. Okay, so indemnity is looking at that. It's trying to put you in a position that you were before you were in that um, or before you sustained that loss. Okay, never ever to enrich that individual or the company. Okay. Right, contribution is a little bit more tricky to understand and here we need to maybe use an example to describe it, okay? I've put a note here. Multiple insurers would only pay a rateable share of any loss bracket the claim settlement. Okay, so here's the example. I've got A and I've got B. Both are insurance companies. Okay, then we've got the driver of a vehicle. Okay, and that vehicle needs insurance. Okay, so if you take out motor vehicle insurance with A, and let's say the vehicle's worth 200. Okay, okay. so A, 200, 1,000 Rand cover. Okay, B, 200 Rand. 200,000 Rand cover. Right, okay. why you would have two insurance policies for the same vehicle, I have no idea, but it's possible. Some people choose to take out more insurance. Uh, and it might be because of maybe um, not knowing. Okay, but you should know things like that because uh, when, when the broker comes to do your assessment, the broker normally needs to look at your needs um, and then they should okay. be able to determine what policies you have. Okay, so it's pointless taking out more insurance. So for example, if you love your car so much that you're going to be taking out three policies on the same vehicle, but mm -hmm. are all three policies going to pay out? No. No. Okay, so if you had 200,000 Rand cover for your vehicle with A and with B, okay, mm -hmm. are you going to get paid 400 if your vehicle gets damaged? Um. Because you've got, remember, you're paying a premium to A and you're paying a premium to B. Yes, I so think you should be because you're paying both those insurance policies. I'm not sure if there's any disclosures regarding that okay. or any regulations. Yeah, it would make sense that you should be entitled to a payout for both companies, right? Yeah. Yes. And you would be, but they only pay out a share of the damages. So if the damages are 200,000, A would pay a share and B would pay a share but they would only pay up to the maximum that you have in terms of cover. Okay. All right, so they'll never ever pay more than what the damages are. And if the damages were 100,000, maybe they'll pay 50-50. So 50 from A, 50 from B, based on a rateable share of the loss. Okay. Okay, so that's why normally you need to be careful with taking out policies because sometimes you might even have too much cover. Okay, because maybe taking out cover with one insurer provides you with a certain benefit. Okay, and then that benefit is also covered under another policy. So you've actually got two policies covering the same loss or same event. Um, the, the policies will never ever both pay out. Okay, in terms of they're both paying the, the, the separate amount. They'll, they'll pay out a portion of it, but never the full amount for each. Okay, so they'll only pay up until the damages. And that's what contribution is. So just think about the word contribution. Contribution means they're contributing to the loss, but it's based on a rateable share of, of the actual amount. Okay. Okay. Then you've got subrogation. Right, so subrogation, the definition here that I've used to summarize the, the concept, insurers can sue the third party who, co who caused the damage for the amount of money paid to the insured for the repairs or the replacement. Right, so do you agree how many parties do we have in an accident? Um, the person that uh, suffered the loss. Okay, good. So you've got the person that actually uh, was in the car accident. So the, the, 
the person that needs to claim. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about the claim, all right, for the person that was in the actual accident. Okay, and then you've got who? The party that caused the accident. Yes. Okay, all right, and then you've got who? The insurance company. So A yes. might be the insurer for that individual, and B might be the insurer for that individual. Yes. Okay, and now you guys have cover for the car accident. Okay, so the, the big crash. Okay, big crash. Okay, all right, so in that scenario, okay, if, if, if this individual, if the guilty party had caused the crash, mm -hmm. whose problem is it? It's the person that caused the accident. Okay, so, but, but do you agree, who is A, uh, or not A, who is the claimer, I'm just going to use it as a claimer, the person claiming, Okay, if they're claiming for a loss, do they claim from B or do they claim from A? Uh, they would claim from both parties. No, no they'll claim no. from A. Yes. No, no, they'll claim from B. Okay, they'll claim from A. So, because remember, you have insurance with your provider, which is A. Yes. If you are in a car accident but someone else caused the accident, you still claim for your, your from insurer. Your company. Yes. Okay, but the. This comes into it, subrogation. Okay. Okay, because now, what does the insurer do? The insurer goes to B, and mm -hmm. they claim from that party because they caused the accident. Yes. Okay, and that's what subrogation is. Subrogation is when you allow your insurer to act on your behalf, to do all the claiming from that guilty party. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right, yeah, and those are three important definitions. So you need to know what indemnity is, contribution, subrogation. And you'll need to apply it either in an example. So, for example, you might be given a scenario where they talk about a situation and ask you to choose the correct answer. Is this describing contribution or is this describing subrogation? Or, or maybe which of the choose the right scenario that describes those events? And then you should be able to, to do that. Okay. okay. Last week we touched on insurable interest. Do you remember what this is? Insurable interest. There's a keyword um, here. Interest. Yeah, you can look at that. So if, if, if you're interested in someone, you have a relationship, insurable. right? So does the yeah. insurer have an insurable interest in you as the client as the, uh, the relationship yes yes okay so insurable interest means there's a legally recognizable relationship between the insured and the financial loss so for example when you see someone else get into a car accident do you claim no no you can't because is the insurable interest there no no insurable interest there's no relationship between you and the financial loss but if your vehicle was in an accident, is there an, in, is there an insurable interest? Yes. Yes, because now it's your vehicle and you've sustained the loss. So there's a relationship between you and the loss that has arose. Yes. Okay, some examples. Owners and joint owners. There's insurable interest there. Okay, so, so for example, um, the house that you guys have, um, is it in both your names, you and your spouse or not? Yes, it is. Okay, so see, there's insurable interest there. So could you take out life cover on his life and could he take out life cover on your life? Uh, I'd have to take it on my own. Well, you could take out on your own, but it's for, yes. uh, it's for what? Part of uh, the property. Insurable, yes. Okay, because there's insurable interest. So, uh, but but can, you, can you take out life cover on, on someone else's life? Uh, no. Well, it's based on Only yours, but for the benefit of someone else. Yes. Okay, so so when looking at insurable interest, there must be a recognizable Relation. relationship. Relation. Okay, yes. So when do we have insurable interest? When we're owners or joint owners of property. Okay? okay. If there's a mortgage, a mortgagee okay, or a mortgager, there's insurable interest. So those two parties are linked. A bailey is a form of um, agent. It's like, it's like a trustee almost. Okay, baileys okay. are similar to trustees. They're holding others' property. Okay, they act as like a conduit. They, they hold it for someone else, on behalf of someone else. 
Just a fancy word for, for that. Okay, agents also, there's insurable interest. Executors in, and trustees, there's insurable interest. Okay, so insurable interest exists when there is a, re a legally recognized relationship. Okay. Okay, it has to be recognized. So you need to say, well, um, so for example, another thing could be insurance. Taking out motor vehicle insurance, okay, if you don't drive the car and someone else does, okay, what must you do? Um, you need to include that person on your insurance policy, okay, because if, you, if, if they're in an accident with your vehicle and you weren't driving it, is there a, record li is there a legally recognized relationship between the insured and the loss? Uh, there isn't if it's not if that person is not included in your insurance. Correct, yeah, because you weren't driving the vehicle, someone else yes. was, and there wasn't yes. a legally recognizable relationship there because the policy would have stated that if you are in a car accident with your vehicle, then they'll re replace or repair your damages. Yes. Okay, so that's that's something that they can enforce as being part of the contract. So they can. They they have a legal uh, they have a legal um, let's say backing or a legal point in terms of not having to pay. If if someone else is driving your vehicle and they're in a car accident, they can actually refuse your claim. Yes. Right, because their grounds for refusing your claim is around that legal that legally recognized relationship between the insured and the financial loss. Okay. Okay. So it gets quite technical. And obviously, sometimes there could be disputes. Later on, we'll look at ways we resolve disputes. Okay, how do we go about addressing that? Because do you agree, um, the insured and the insurer aren't always going to want the same thing? Yes. Correct. Okay, if you're in a car accident, you probably don't want your car to be repaired. You want a new vehicle. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but from the insurer's point of view, it might not be financially viable or uh, or, or, or financially, um, let's say, it doesn't make economic sense um, to replace the vehicle when repairing it could be cheaper. Sure. Yeah, so it, it all depends. And that, that's where the disputes come up. Okay, because now you're arguing, no, I want a new vehicle, but they're arguing, no, we're going to repair it. Okay. All right, so when must insurable interest apply? There's three scenarios that you need to know. And again, from an exam or test point of view, these are NB. They're often tested in different questions where they talk about different insurance classes. Okay, so we get general insurance, which is looking at your fire, your accident, your motor, and so on. Okay, then you get marine, which is specific to like uh, fleets of ships and that's like, it's like a marine, so uh, boats and that. And then you've got long-term insurance. Okay, okay, obviously looking at like, li like lives. Okay, so life insurance as, as an example. So when must insurance, insurable interest apply? Well, when we talk about apply, we're looking at when must you determine it? When must you, in, when, when must you establish that there is a legally recognized relationship? Okay, so yeah. the first one is at all stages, every stage. Okay, okay, at the issue, at the time of the loss, and at renewal. Okay, if it's general. Right, there must be insurable interest. Insurable interest mean, means legally recognized relationship. So okay. when you take out the policy, before you take out the policy, they need to establish insurable interest. Right, then later, if you're in a, a car accident, then they need, to they, they need to establish it at the time of the loss. And then they also establish it at the renewal date. Okay. Okay, with marine, it's only at time of loss. So only when the ship sinks, do they then consider if there was insurable interest or not? Okay, because remember, if the boat has maybe um, traveled to a different destination, okay, it might, be, it might be sitting with the other party in terms of liability. The liability might not be with you any longer. Okay. Okay, the risks of ownership may have transferred. So that's why they look at at time of loss. When did the loss actually arise? If the loss did arise, um, before or after, perhaps in terms of transfer of ownership, then one or the other party may be liable for the, for the loss. Okay. And then the last one is long-term insurance. And that's an easy one that you can remember because if you think about it, just think about life cover. Yes. Okay? 
can you take out life cover of, of let's say um, for your spouse yes I can yes yeah, so when is that determined at policy issue so before you can take like before you can take life cover out for your spouse you need to look at is there a legally recognized relationship okay. and that's when they issue the policy okay so only once they issue the policy does that insurable interest need to apply okay, okay. Mm -hmm. all right then we've got a note about risk I, I asked you for the definition a while back i think yes. you you're comfortable with that right uncertainty yes, yes. okay that's what risk is and if we're looking at risk are there different types there always is okay so the textbook describes each set of risk okay in a different category and i'll try to keep it simple so you can understand it um, the first one is fundamental. If you talk about the word fundamental, what does that mean? Um, fundamental, like basics, right? Yes. Okay, things that affect everyone. Okay. okay, so fundamental risks are risks that affect everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Um, it doesn't matter. It looks at fundamental. So, for example, an earthquake, war, riot, um, famines, maybe. Um, they all affect everyone. So in terms of risk, that's the classification that they would use to describe it. Okay, a fundamental risk is going to affect everyone because it's, it's widespread. Okay. Right. What is a pure and speculative risk? Well, here you're focusing on um, the potential for, for loss possibly occurring. Okay, so insurance focuses on pure risk when events with no loss or loss as a possibility. So I can have loss or I won't have loss. Right, there's going to be a, a, a probability attached to that. There's uncertainty. Remember, risk is uncertainty. We just have different forms of uncertainty. So here with the pure risk, you're looking at that. You're looking at events with no loss or loss as a possibility. Right, pure risk cannot involve a possible profit. Okay, so there's no uh, speculation, okay, which is the next bit. A speculative risk is when we're looking at the hope for some gain, okay, like credit risk cover. Right, there's, there's a potential of um, profit or potential or possible, okay, there's a possibility of profit. Right, so, so pure risks involves two outcomes, either loss or no loss. Okay, so okay. let me talk about life cover. Is life cover mm -hmm. pure risk? Uh, I think it's speculative. Okay, life cover. Um, life cover would be pure risk because pure risk. the event is no loss, so you don't die or yeah. you do die. So that's pure risk because it's either okay. no loss or loss. You either die or you don't. Okay. <laughs> okay, if we're looking at life cover. Yeah. Okay, speculative risk is taken with the hope of gaining something. Okay, so gaining something is slightly different. So a speculative risk, uh, it would be um, normally looking at some sort of gain and the provision of insurance may act as like a, um, a distinct, um, let's say, it's, it's almost like preventing, uh, it's like preventing you from uh, from from doing something okay that will give rise to that event okay so if I'm looking at a speculative risk we're looking at the hope of some gain okay so what is the gain going to be if I'm looking at a credit risk what is the gain that I'm going to be getting from the credits to be receiving some money it'll be the interest yes receiving money correct but now if that doesn't arise then I get paid out from the insurer so okay. do you see how that's speculative? Because I think or I know that my or I expect my debtor to pay with interest. See, there's okay. a hope for some sort of gain. Okay. Okay. So can you take up credit? Uh, can you take out a policy on that? Yes, you can. Okay, and that would be like credit risk cover, where if that doesn't happen, so if that gain that you were hoping for doesn't materialize, mm -hmm. are you still going to get paid out? Yes, you can. Okay, that's speculative. Right, then you get particular. Particular is looking at a specific cause. Okay, so what caused the actual loss? 
right a particular risk so it could be the examples i've got here is a break-in or an explosion okay do you agree if a break-in or explosion arises that's going to affect us in terms of our loss yes see and that's specific okay maybe even like a um what else okay so motor car accident would a motor car accident be a particular risk uh yes yes it would because there's a there's a specific cause right someone was driving recklessly and caused an accident so a motor vehicle accident would be a particular risk it wouldn't be fundamental because a motor car accident doesn't affect everyone it's not pure in terms of no loss or loss because that's not the only probability right and then we've got speculative which is looking at the hope for some gain there's no gain there either okay so there the focus is more on the cause the reason why it, ar it arose okay which is a particular risk okay okay so those three are key right and then obviously once you've got those three you can then determine if something is insurable or not okay so off do you think fundamental risks are insurable uh, no, it's natural disasters. Probably not, yeah. A, a large amount of them aren't. But in more recent times, things have changed quite a bit. So think about hail cover. Yeah. Hail cover for your vehicle. Yes, I do have that. Okay, so let's think about that. If your vehicle is caught in a storm, and let's say it, it, the hail is, 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 is terrible, and the hailstones are the size of... Um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, massive um, hailstones, uh, golf balls, or even bigger, larger. Right, okay. and they completely wreck the vehicle. They dent the vehicle, they damage the windscreen, and all of that. Is that an insurable risk? Yeah, I know that mine is, so yes. Correct. It's insurable because in today's world, it has become a more common event. So, can they pull that risk together? Yes, they can. So, notice how. They've made money from a product that is actually seen as fundamental in terms of risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, they've brought a product hail cover. So if you are in a terrible storm and your vehicle is damaged, that creates a fundamental risk in terms of an opportunity for the insurer to insure it as an insurable risk. So if it's insurable, there needs to be a loss, either accidental or fortuitous. Okay. okay, there needs to be it needs to be insurable. So someone needs to be willing to underwrite it, okay, and to carry it as a risk in terms of a transfer, a transfer from you as the insured to the insurer, and there needs to be risks of similar risks. Okay, so the risk can't only be unique to your situation. It needs to be similar, and then it's insurable. Okay, so okay. because everyone can be in a car accident, anyone with a vehicle can be in a car accident. It's a similar type of risk, and therefore it can be pulled okay, as a product that people can make use of. Okay. Right, and then the last one is legality. Right, can you take out um, insurance for unlawful activities? No. No, you can't. Okay, so if you're doing something, so for example, um, illegal activities uh, against public policy, uh, let's see, okay, murder. Okay, so obviously, if you you can't take out life cover for killing someone. No, you can't. Yeah, that would be illegal against public policy. Uh, even suicide. Okay, is suicide event in inverted commas illegal? Um, if I you think take it is. your own yes. life, <laughs> if you take your own life, would your would your uh, policy pay out your loved ones? No. Why not? Because it's self inflicted exactly it's like you're committing murder on yourself yeah. okay it's it's against public policy uh, committing suicide would 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 basically create a scenario where um, the the benefits won't be paid out mm -hmm. okay All right then we've got a note here about the claims okay in terms of um, the process around insurance um, proposals and and how and how the actual contract works um, when looking at contracts based on good faith, this is an important term that they often talk about, but they don't tell you what it means. Okay, so we need to learn a little bit of Latin relating to specific areas of contract law, okay, that relates to this industry being insurance. Okay, so when talking about the contracts, if the contracts are based on good faith, 
They call that u- u- uberima fides. Okay, so what does that mean? If if contracts must be in good faith, we spoke about it earlier about um, uh, trust. Yes, it has to do with trust. Exactly. Tr- what does it have to do with trust? You have to trust your insurance company that they would. Keep you going, just have that faith in them. Uh, what must they do? What's their role? Uh, if you have a claim, they need to pay out. They need to cover your loss. Okay, correct. They so do you agree? That they would do that. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. do you agree they have to then provide you with all those stipulations? Yes. So your contract, okay, the proposal. Okay. okay, but at the same time, you have an obligation as well because the contract is based based on good faith. So yes. they tell you what they're going to do and then you're going to have to do what? Disclose. You have to be honest. Correct. Okay, so if you're disclosing information to the provider, it's based on good faith. All right, so yes. you need to disclose information and that's why depending on what type of insurance you're taking out, they normally use this, a reasonable man test. Okay, what does that mean? It's looking at what information is relevant. Okay, so here's the example. Right, do you have some form of life cover or life insurance? Yes. Okay, and then you've obviously got the motor insurance as well, right? Yes. Okay, when taking out those two different types of policies, right, was the disclosure or the level of disclosure the same? Uh, No, it's not. What was different? Um, I think with driving, uh, they do not ask you about like health. They don't ask you anything health related. Okay. With life insurance, you have to disclo- disclose all your health issues that you may have. Correct. And and also they they probably took some sort of um, DNA, so either uh, saliva or blood or something uh, when yep. when they when they issued you with your uh, insurance, your life insurance policy. Yes. Okay, it was probably either saliva or blood. And why do they do that? To see if you're taking drugs. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a way to test that that individual has disclosed everything because they can obviously test based on DNA and so on to pick up maybe different diseases or HIV or not. And that's something that they need to do as the insurer because it's their responsibility to make sure that you're not too high risk and that you have disclosed everything to them as well. Yes. Okay, but that's reasonable man test. So now, what happens if you went to the insurance company that's going to cover your vehicle, and they asked you for a blood test? Um, that would be very unreasonable. Yes. Okay, because why would motor car insurance require a blood test? It's got nothing to do with underwriting. Hmm. Okay, having cancer or not having cancer or being a smoker or not being a smoker isn't going to affect your driving ability or um, your, your motor vehicle insurance. Yes. Okay, but being a smoker or a non-smoker when taking out life cover makes a big difference. Yes. Okay, good. And I think if I remember correctly, you mentioned you're a non-smoker. Yes. All right, so if you're a non-smoker, what happens if you start smoking? I would have to disclose that information. Correct. If I'm Why? With, Why? Because if I'm diagnosed with any illness that relates to the smoking, I won't be covered. Correct. See, that's that's important. See, reasonable yes. mentality. That's based on trust. Yes. Okay, good. Well done. All right, then, I've just given some paid references here for an example proposal. Okay, because you've taken out motor vehicle and, um, and, and life insurance, I think you're comfortable with having seen an example. This is more for students that have never seen a proposal before um, they do show you one on page 52 to 56 which covers all the detail okay, it's quite long they give you like a letter and then they talk about all the different um, sections of the policy in reality policies look very different okay they're not as summarized as this because it's a textbook example right so I would rather refer you to something that you have um, as a way to identify the different categories. Okay, so when looking at the policy, what do they always specify? Um, 
do they do they specify all the things they will do or do they specify all the things they won't do um both most most importantly what is not covered as well correct okay that's the most important bit so when looking at those insurance contracts the emphasis is always on what isn't going to be covered because then there's no room for debate. Okay, but yes. now can you imagine if they had to put everything that is covered? The list will be completely insane. It'll be lo much longer. The policies will be a lot longer as well because now yes. they need to describe every single scenario where they will pay out. Yes. Okay, and that's why contracts um, rather focus on things that they won't do because then you're clear about that. And remember, that's based on facts. Okay, so in their, in their terms and conditions, t the, in their T's and C's, they'll explain what they don't cover because they, they never ever want that to be a question mark. Yes. They want, they want that to be specific they, so they can refer to the contract and see, well, here is a scenario that I'm not willing to cover. Right, they don't want to look at all the scenarios they will cover because if they are going to cover it, they'll cover it. Okay. The problem comes in is when they don't want to cover it, then they need that in their contracts to protect themselves. Okay. okay. What is SASRIA? SASRIA is, 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 um, is an acronym that stands for the South African Special Risks Insurance Association, which covers risks in SA against loss of damage arising from riot, strike and civil commotion whether politically or non-politically motivated. Okay. okay, is SASRIA a compulsory benefit that you need to include on your contracts? So when you took out motor vehicle insurance, was it compulsory to take out SASRIA or did they ask you to? Uh, I've never been asked to. Okay, it, it's normally a, a, a tick that you can include on the, on the policy. Um, do you want to include SASRIA or not? Because SASRI is a separate body, it's a South African Special Risk Ins Insurance Association which covers loss or damage against riots or strikes. So for example, Melanie, if you yeah. don't have SASRI included in your policy okay, on, for your motor vehicle, okay, and let's say you've parked your vehicle close to some sort of um, politically, a political um, event, and that yes. political event gets out of control, people riot and strike and people burn tires and damage property and your vehicle is caught up in that riot or strike. Will your insurer pay for those damages? No, it won't. No, it won't. It's probably an exclusion in your contract. Okay. But if you include it to include SASRIA, could you be able to claim that as part of SASRIA? Yes. Yes, you would. Okay, because that'll be included as a benefit on the contract. But it needs to be chosen though. You need to specifically include it on your contract. Okay. Okay, so um, it's not compulsory. They don't just put it in automatically. It, it, it's something that you need to voluntarily ask for or at least uh, tick the box or um, accept it Okay, when, when taking out the, the cover. Okay. okay. So maybe that's something to ask your um, insurer the next time you meet with the broker because how often should you be reviewing your contracts? Every year. I actually just put a note down here to check mine. <laughs> okay, yeah. Every year. Why? Because contracts are renewed. Okay, in a section later on, um, we cover renewals and then we'll discuss that. We'll talk about time frame. We'll talk about what they do. So what does the insurer actually do uh, when renewal comes and what must you consider as well? Okay, so when focusing on SASRIA, it's something that can be included on a contract and that is voluntary, uh, voluntary, okay, meaning that you would include it as part of your contract. And when renewing contracts, you would have to specifically state for it to be included or not. Okay, but it's a benefit. It's a benefit for you as the insured to include it because it's something that the government, okay, provides as a special organization, okay, a special association that covers risk. Because remember, we saw riots and strikes in that in the earlier. What type of risk is that? Pure, speculative, fundamental, or uh, what was the other one? I forget. Um, particular. Oh, I did say that. Particular, pure, and yeah. fundamental. Yeah, that was all of them. Um, I think it'll be a fundamental. Fundamental, exactly. Because a right or strike will affect a large amount yeah. of people. Okay, yes. civil commotion. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, then the textbook goes on further, and they talk about this. 
the proposal, the procedure, and the policy. When does it actually get issued? Okay, so once the risks have been identified, there needs to be some sort of acceptance. Okay, and, and, and you need to accept the terms and conditions as well as the cost that's going to uh, be applicable to that actual policy. So the premium we know is what? The payment. It's what payment, we yes. pay what for pay. the cover. Yes. Okay, and then you've got different types of policies, householders, house owners, inventory, all risk mode, there's such a lot. Okay, there's a lot of different types of policies. Okay, but in today's world, everything is um, is more convenient because we, we spoke about a multi-peril policy. I don't know if you remember that. Um, no, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, we, we spoke about multi-peril. What does multi-peril mean? Multiple risks. So do multiple policies... Risks. Or do contracts cover multiple risks, or do we have one contract for everything? Uh, no, it's um, we have different contracts. No, we have one contract which covers multiple risks. Okay. Okay, so that's a multi-peril policy. Okay, where you've got a specific contract or provider or insurer stating all the different risks that could arise as part of that contract. Okay, and then okay. quotes are obviously important. So the document needs to be presented to the insured and the insured needs to accept all the terms and conditions before the actual contract is in place and cover is provided. Okay, so okay. cover is only provided once the contract has been accepted. Okay, and signed. Okay. All right, just a note about premium collection. Uh, th this is more related to who, the insurer or the insured? The premium collection. Who collects the premium? Uh, the insurer. The insurer. Okay, sometimes you have a scenario where there's an intermediary. Okay, so the intermediary actually collects it on behalf of the insurer. It just depends how the policy is structured. Okay, so when you look at short-term insurance, the Act covers a maximum rate of commission of this 12 and a half and 20 percent that's commission okay remember commission is charged by the broker or the intermediary okay the middle the middle person the middle person makes a profit off the commission okay so selling those policies and collecting those premiums maximum rate according to the act 12 and a half to 20 percent okay depending on what is it motor vehicle or other Okay. okay. Does that mean we can get a, a lower commission? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so you can have commission that's lower, but you yeah. can't have commission that's higher. It's capped. Higher. Okay, it's capped okay. to protect the consumer or to protect the insured as well. Okay, okay. paying over premiums. Intermediaries have to pay over premiums within 15 days, and premiums due in terms of new policies there's a 15-day grace period allowed okay, in terms of renewal. Right, so what happens when a renewal occurs? Well, that means that they've renewed your cover for another 12 months. Okay, okay. Remember, if it's short term, it gets reviewed every 12 months because they need to establish risk and they need to do some underwriting again. Right, so with a new policy, premiums are due on inception date. Okay, so when you actually have a new policy being um, started, the premium is due on inception date okay so when is the actual policy going to arise okay that date when it arises in terms of inception so when i'm starting the contract the premium is due with renewal you have 15 days grace all right so there's a grace period before the premium actually becomes due and then we've got methods of payment which are very straightforward um non-payment so if individuals haven't paid Okay, yep. there's a 15 day grace period for renewal premiums, okay, which is what we had earlier in terms of premiums due. All right, so individuals, people have it a bit easier, okay, because they're people, but businesses have it more strict in terms of the actual premiums that have to be paid. It needs to be paid on time, normally ahead of time as well. Okay. Right, then we've got different parts of the policy. You've got a heading, a preamble, um, operating clauses, exceptions, general conditions. Uh, you've got a schedule and you've got disclosure. All of this is part of the actual policy. 
Right, these aren't so important. I haven't seen them test too much about the detail around this. What I have seen though is this. The exception. They normally talk about an exception versus an exclusion. Okay, we'll discuss the differences later. Exclusions, uh, O-N, exclusions versus exceptions. There is a slight difference between the two. Okay, we'll okay. discuss what they are later on. Okay, they are general conditions. So, remember we spoke about subrogation. Do you remember what that is? Um, yes, we just spoke about it now. Uh, you and the insurer, what does subrogation involve? Uh, it's when I if it's when I came for an accident I didn't cause and then my insurer claims from the person that actually from the person's insurance that actually uh, caused the accident. Yes, nice. Okay, correct. So so basically subrogation is when you give rights to your insurer to help um, uh, collect the outstanding from the guilty party, correct. Okay, contribution, do you remember what that was? Uh, contribution. Think about having more than one policy on the same thing. Uh, it's when uh, you have two insurance policy and they pay uh, a portion of that uh, claim. Correct. Okay, a portion is paid, not the entire claim. Because you've got multiple insurers covering the same event or the same loss. Okay, yes. great. And that covers that section. All right. And this is a few notes that we had from last week. That we had to cover. Um, I've got one more to cover with you today. Um, study unit five. It's also a nice short section. It's looking at the renewal. Okay, so we just spoke about a renewal. We looked at the premiums. We now need to expand a bit more on that particular concept. Okay, okay. so um, this you actually covered with me earlier. I asked you about the short-term insurance market. Okay, last week we didn't cover all the notes. We we left a, a, a few to cover this week. Um, this week we recapped these groups, so I'm happy with that. This is the, the first bit of the, the new section. Okay, there are only three learning outcomes here, so it's a lot shorter than um, some of the other modules. Some modules are quite long, um, some are a bit shorter. Uh, this is one of the shorter um, sections, okay, looking at a renewal. Right, so the first thing that I want to ask you is this word renew. What does that mean? Uh. When you renew an existing contract. Correct. Okay, so something existing is going to possibly continue. Continue, yeah. Yes. Okay, so the key word there is continue or renew. Okay, are, is cover automatic? Let me ask you that. Cover automatic. Um, is cover automatic? So, for example, you're with your insurer for car insurance. Is that an automatic cover? Meaning every year you're automatically going to be covered. Uh, I think I would have to be the one who'd say to continue because it, every year I'd have to continue the same contract has to be, be renewed every year. Is it the same contract every year? Uh, no. No. Okay, it's a different contract every year. So that's the big difference with short-term and long-term insurance. Long-term insurance doesn't change every year because when you take out life cover, it's life cover. Yeah. Okay, every year you'll have that life cover unless you specifically change the, the contract yourself. Um, it's going to remain the same. Okay. Okay, renewal is when you're actually taking a short-term contract and you're going to be wanting to continue it for the next 12 months. So the renewal process involves a lot more, let's say, um, checks and balances that need to be done first because it's literally starting a new contract. Okay, because when your, when your motor car insurance ends at the end of the 12 months, your vehicle actually isn't covered. There isn't an inverted commas like automatic renewal. Right, you can negotiate that with your insurer and normally insurers want to keep you as a client. So if insurers yes. want to keep you as a client, they're obviously going to want to keep you covered. Yes. It's in their best interest as well to make sure you keep um, paying your premium and you keep um, being a client of that particular organization. So normally, in a, in a practical sense, they do tend to allow you to continue it but not always the case. Let's say during the last 12 months, you were in several accidents. Mm -hmm. Has your risk changed? Yes. 
Okay, so they can refuse to cover you if you're a very high risk client. Insurers can actually say no to you as a client, but you as a, as a client can also say no to them as a provider. Yes. Okay, so you can literally change insurance companies every year if you wanted. And some mm-hmm. people do do that. Some people hop insurance companies like crazy because they keep getting better and better cover for the same premium or they keep getting the same cover at a better premium. Okay. Okay, and that's why every year you should view your motor vehicle insurance because every year what happens to your vehicle? The value depreciates. Exactly, the value depreciates. So for the insurer, they actually should decrease the premium every year because your value of the vehicle is not worth the same. Yes. So if you keep the same cover, okay, and you have the same vehicle, the premium should come down every year, not go yes. up. Yes. But if it goes up, it's because of risk. You might be a higher risk client now than you were before because of your claims history. Okay. Or it could be because of other factors. Okay. okay, so a renewal isn't automatic. All right, so just a reference here. This comes from chapter four. It's focusing on this. Contracts that need to be reviewed every year. Okay, mm-hmm. and those are short-term. Right, short-term contracts is year by year, month by month. And those are the ones that we're looking at here. Okay. Okay, so what are the big differences? I've tried to show them here on the diagram. Okay, so short-term on the left, long-term on the right. Short-term is for one year, long-term is for longer. When looking at negotiation, okay, the insurer and the insured can renegotiate. Right, so you have as much right to talk to the provider to reduce it every year, and they also have as much right to perhaps increase or change it depending on the scenario. Okay, it's a, it's a negotiation that takes place. Okay, okay. as an individual, your biggest, um, let's say, the biggest thing that you can raise with your motor vehicle insurance is the depreciation, okay? Because vehicles depreciate, that's a known fact. And vehicles depreciate quite a lot, obviously depending on its use as well, okay? So car insurance should be one, should be a form of insurance that should actually get cheaper, not more expensive. Because if every year, if your car insurance is going up 10, 20% every year, you're going to have to ask questions because that's very strange. Yes. Right, and if that's the case, um, there needs to be some sort of explanation why. Right, I would expect that your cover is maybe improving, okay, or the, the benefits are improving. But if it's not, if you're getting the same benefits but your insurer is asking you to increase the premium every year, well, then there's big question marks. Then you need to hop insurer, change insurer, go to someone else. Okay, because does it... Um, Okay, here's the question. Can you change car insurance co- um, companies every month if you wanted to? You can, possibly. You can, actually, yeah. yeah. Right. With short-term insurance, it's short-term. Okay, it's like buying groceries, short-term. Okay, you don't yes. have to buy from the same store every month. Yes. Every month you can buy from a different store if you wanted to. Okay, and that's what insurance is. It's just a product. It's a financial product. Okay, so the annual renewal basis can apply. See, there's the word, it may apply. Right, so you could possibly have that as part of your policy. So then it's like almost inverted commas, like an automatic renewal almost. Okay. Okay. All right, the next bit is a renewal listing. Okay, so what is this? Whose perspective are we looking at? Renewal listing. Uh, the insurer. Correct. Mm. Why? Uh, the renewal listing. You're right. Why does the insurer? have to look at the renewal listing. Uh, Maybe there's changes. Okay, almost, it's underwriting. Okay, because what did we say the insurer is focused on? Reducing risk as much as possible. 
Yes. So does the insurer want a whole bunch of clients that aren't meeting their requirements in terms of being a good client? No. No. Okay, so as much as the insured wants to stay with the insurer, the insurer can also deny, okay, cover to certain insured clients if they're not willing to accept that risk. But we said earlier, practically that doesn't make sense because the insurer would rather want more clients on their book than less. Yes. Okay? But they can implement this in terms of underwriting. Okay, so what happens is before renewal, the underwriter will receive a listing of policies that are due for renewal. And what is the underwriter's job? Um, to establish the, the risks. risks. Yeah. Okay, so their job is to measure. Have things stayed the same or have things changed? Okay. So have you claimed over the last 12 months or haven't you? If you have claimed, then that's going to change your profile slightly versus if you haven't claimed. So if you haven't claimed all over the last 12 months, you as the insured, okay, as the client, you even have more power in inverted commas or more negotiation, let's say leverage, okay, when, when having that discussion because you haven't claimed. So does that make you a better or worse client? A better client. That makes you a better client. So now you have that leverage. So use that leverage to your advantage when the renewal comes up. Because if they're not willing to give you a better premium or a better or better cover or benefits, then other insurers would give you that benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's why when it comes to short term insurance, the industry is very um, competitive. Right. Because every insurer out there wants the good clients. So if you're the good client, and I know you're the good client, Melanie, because you've mentioned yes. before that you haven't claimed for like the last few years, right? Yes. Okay, so, so you've got lots of leverage when it comes to the renewal because you have that in terms of your claims history. It's like, it's like applying for credit. Like you think about applying yes. to the bank for credit. If you've got a good credit rating, are you going to get a good interest rate? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Because why? Because the bank needs to make it attractive for you to go with them as a provider rather than going to someone else. Because if the bank was to give you prime and your credit rating is so good, you could probably go to another bank and get prime minus. Yes. Okay, so that's why they need to make it attractive for you as the client. And that's why for, for clients who have a really good track record in terms of not claiming, they have lots of leverage when it comes to the renewal because you could literally play one company off another. Okay, if this insurer is willing to give you this quote, another insurer is willing to give you another quote, you're obviously going to choose the best quote and the quotes are the same. It doesn't matter who covers your car. You just want the car to be fixed when the car needs to be fixed. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't matter which company is covering the vehicle, as long as you've got the cover, as long as you're getting the most benefit from that product as you possibly can. Yes. Okay, sure. so the example here, a short term insurance policy has a renewal date of 1st Jan. Okay, the advance listing is two months in advance. Mm -hmm. When is this going to appear on the advance listing? What date? So it'll be in November of yes. the previous year. Correct. Okay, the policy will appear on the advance listing in November. Okay, okay, two months prior to the renewal. Okay. Okay. So what is the purpose of the advance listing then? Uh, you'll be able to review your client whether there's been claims or no claims correct good it's like a form of notice it's, it's saying that okay these policies are going to be coming up for renewal okay we need to now re-establish the risks we need to yeah. reevaluate the risks and now we need to reevaluate the contract before the actual renewal comes around Okay, so during that time, 
the insurer may choose to not accept certain clients because they're too high risk or the client could then choose to approach other um, providers to provide quotes okay. okay to give quotes for the next 12 months in terms of the actual short term okay okay so that's the purpose. The purpose is almost like, um, it's like a notice, that's the best way I can put it. It, it allows the underwriter to, to determine risk again. That's the key, risk. Always, okay, okay. insurable risk and, and loss, even potential loss. Okay, so loss. Has the, has the probability of loss increased or not? Okay. Okay, so the underwriter needs advanced listing ahead of the renewal date which also benefits the representative as cover may need to be placed elsewhere. Right, so do you agree, if you've been claiming a lot from one provider, they might not want to keep you as a client, so what must you do? You might have to approach a different provider. Yes. Okay, because you still want cover, but you might not be able to get it from your current provider based on certain reasons perhaps, okay? Yes. And then you'll have to approach someone else. So you're still covered when that renewal date comes up. Mm -hmm. Right, a note over here about claims experience. The underwriter considers the number of claims and the size or the value. Is that important? Yes, it is. Yes, because this looks at severity. Okay. Okay, and then remember earlier on we spoke about uh, financial loss okay, in terms of the financing. Remember, we can take risk and we can risk management and we can break it up. This is the money side of it. Okay, so this is the throwing money at the problem to solve the problem. Okay. Okay, so when looking at underwriters, if we look at the number of claims, that's the frequency. Okay. Okay, so frequency versus severity. Okay, how often did you claim versus how severe were the claims? Okay, so how many times did you have to claim for the entire vehicle versus how many times did you have to claim for maybe a, 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 win, a windscreen repair or something, something minor, something small. Right, and then we've got a note here about trends and we've got a note here about conclusions. Who determines this? The underwriter. Underwriters will have a list of different things that they consider. Okay. Okay, and underwriters can have a very strict list. So if you don't comply, there's no way that you're going to get any cover. The, the rules are set in stone in terms of the bare minimum. Okay, so what are the bare minimums and then what do they then look at on top of that? Okay, so they look at other things involving maybe um, uh, maybe lifestyle in terms of, or even where you live, perhaps in terms of geography. Okay, it could be anything, client specific, uh, geography, risk related. It could be anything that will affect your current scenario. And then they'll also then come to a conclusion. So is the premium fair? Is it fair to charge Melanie this amount for the next 12 months when she hasn't claimed for the last few years? That, those are the things that they need to discuss and, dis and, and decide on when then providing you with the renewal. Right? And once they've provided you with that, you then either accept or you go elsewhere. Okay? Or you choose which option is the best. Okay. Okay. Right, so what is lapsing? What does that word mean? something falls away good okay so when does it fall away when it's not renewed okay so your policy will actually lap if you don't renew it and that's why in these two months leading up to the renewal these are key months because if you don't if you don't search for other claim and uh, not other claims if you don't search for other policies okay if you have a claim that arises later on and you haven't renewed your policy, you might be sitting with no insurance when you thought you had insurance. True. And that's a risk. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's important to sit with the broker or to sit with the advisor or to sit with the intermediary and to renegotiate this before the policies actually come up for renewal. Right, and that's why um, brokers and advisors and... and, and um, Insurers, okay, intermediaries, they're normally busy at certain times of the year when most claims are coming up for, not claims, when most policies are coming up for renewals. Okay, that's, that's when they make their most business okay, in terms of renewals. Because when the renewal comes around, that's commission for the broker or commission for the intermediary. 
So it's also in their best interest to meet with you. Okay, because as much as you want to renew the policy or at least get more benefits for that um, um, from that provider, it's also in their interest as well because they're trying to get more commission as well. Yes. Okay, so it's a win-win if you think about it. But it, it, it's a discussion that needs to be had. It's a discussion that needs to be um, had in terms of a, a, an actual um, process that needs to take place. Okay, so here are your options. Right, so what can come out of the, all that negotiation? Well, there's a few things. The first thing is about the premium. Is your premium mm -hmm. going to stay the same? Is your premium going to come down? Or are they going to keep your premium the same? Okay, unchanged. Increase, decrease, or unchanged. Okay, so from your experience, Melanie, every year yep. when you've had to review your car insurance, what has yes. the trend been like? Has it gone up? Has it decreased? Has it stayed the same? What, 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 what have you picked up? It's decreased. Okay, so that's good. So that means the provider that you've got is doing things correctly in terms of reviewing your risk, checking your claims history, and then giving you a premium that's lower than what it currently is. Right, and it's not yes. only lower because the vehicle has depreciated, but it's also lower because you're a better client. Okay. Okay, so if they're just lowering your premium because your vehicle's worth less, well, mm -hmm. then they're not considering how good a client you are. Yeah. And that's why you shouldn't always go to the... Per so, for example, if you're with company A, and that's the car insurance company that you're with, Obviously, if you don't get a quote from another competitor, you'll never know if they're actually giving you a lower premium because your vehicle has just depreciated or it's because they actually view you as a valuable client because you haven't claimed. Yes, true. Right. You won't know what you won't know if you don't check with okay. someone else. Yes. It's that second opinion. Right. And that's yes. why if you're meeting with those people, it's good to get a quote from your existing provider. And then it's also good to get a competitive quote from someone else because that tells you, is the insurer that I'm with actually looking at me as a client or are they just looking at me as business? That's what, you're, that's what you need to determine. Yes. Do they actually care about you as the client or do they just care about the sale? Okay. And you won't know that if you don't compare it to something else. That's true. Okay. Right, and then we spoke about terms and conditions. Here's the slide about it. Terms and conditions are important, especially with contracts. Can the terms and conditions change? Yes, with renewal it can. Definitely. All right, so they can add certain things to your contract when renewal comes around for certain things. Okay, so maybe the risks in certain areas have a, uh, had, had, had gone up and they might need to change certain things. So maybe if... if um, if hailstorms become a, a frequent thing, right, it used to be quite bad in the past and that's why they created the product. But now, hailstorms today, I mean, you don't really hear about cars being damaged by a lot of hailstorms now. It, it, it was big news in the past when we had like these freak storms and now these freak storms have sort of, sort of disappeared, but now no, you still have all down. this cover for hail cover. Yes. So now, that's something that they could also review. So if maybe these freak storms become more common, then they might include something as part of your contract. Maybe they'll exclude it, perhaps, or maybe they'll change it, uh, change it in terms of maybe having to pay an additional premium for it specifically. Right, so some, some insurance companies actually include the cover for free, inverted commas, okay, or they include it as a separate item. So do you want to include health cover on your policy or not? Okay. Okay. All right, then we've got a survey. Okay, a survey is very similar to underwriting, but it looks at something a little bit different. Okay, a survey is investigating the risk in more detail by employing the skills of a specialist. Okay, so if I'm looking at large commercial risk, is called a surveyor. Okay, so this is looking at bigger, bigger, bigger customers or clients. All right, okay. um, let's talk about construction. Mm -hmm. Okay, the example that I'm going to show you is about construction. Right, you probably heard last year, uh, was it last Yeah, it was last year. Uh, last year, you probably heard um, there, was a, there was a bridge that collapsed in Johannesburg. Yes. Uh, it, was, it, was on the most, it was on the busiest highway in, in the city. Okay, so yes. imagine the busiest highway in Durban. 
okay and a bridge that they were building literally collapsed on the highway and killed people that's what happened sure it was, it's terrible i saw it on the news you saw it on the news yeah it was yeah. it was and and who was the company that did it it was marion roberts was the company that was building the bridge yeah and that company suffered losses because that had a rose i mean you're driving on the highway and you need to go under the bridge to go from one side to the other and now yes. if you were unlucky and you were at that moment in time when the bridge literally just collapsed and people were, were, were caught under the bridge some some were injured some died and and mm -hmm. that's a very big risk for who it's uh m and r the construction company exactly yeah okay so when looking at large commercial risks the surveyor so for example i'm assuming i don't know all the detail about the case but obviously they're a big corporate company right there should be liability cover for things like that occurring okay so there should be some sort of um insurer okay remember Mar uh, marion roberts are the company the insurer is covering them for risk for things like that public liability yeah. Okay, so if that insurer, that insurer probably suffered a bit of a loss if Marion Roberts was covered for events like that occurring. Because now the insurer is going, to have to, is going to have to pay compensation to all those people that lost their lives in that particular crash or event. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay, right. So with a survey, a surveyor is looking at detail. They're employing the skills of a specialist because, I mean, if, if you and I, if we had to go to that, um, uh, if we had to go to a construction site, we're not engineers, we're not architects, we're, we don't know what to look for. And that's why they yeah. need to employ the help of a surveyor, someone who's a specialist that can actually identify what is the risk here. Are the risks higher or lower than before? And that's what they do. Okay, so details need to be recorded and they normally do that with a physical inspection. Okay, they actually go on site and they determine the risk or they look at this. Okay, eyes and ears, meaning they're trying to understand what the, um, um, the it's almost like it's like painting a picture. Okay, the, the, the underwriter, the, the surveyor acts as the underwriter's um investigator okay like a private investigator so if you okay let's say you you suspect someone doing something okay then what happens an investigation takes place yes okay so the surveyor is that it's the additional information okay that the underwriter is then going to use because do you agree the underwriter is an expert in terms of the number crunching yes okay so you normally have um what do they call them actuaries that's it Yes. Okay, actuaries work for these big underwriters because why? They are the statisticians. They're the mathematicians. They're very good with the numbers. Right, so they can allocate a probability. What is the probability of someone who's smoking, who's 30 years old, who's, um, let's say, with diabetes, who's, I don't know, X, Y, and Z. Okay, and they can place a value on that person's life. Okay, yes. that's what they do. That's what actuaries do. Actuaries take things that are probable, mm -hmm. okay, and they assign a rand value to it. Okay, so what's the probability of someone dying? Okay, or, or let's say someone who's 60 years old. 60-year-old male who's a non-smoker, um, what's the probability of that individual dying? Okay, and then based on that, then they'll say, well, that individual can take out so much life cover. Okay, and also, do you agree, not everyone has the same inverted commas value? Yes. Okay, so, for example, certain individuals can take out a certain amount of life cover, but not everyone can take out the same amount of life cover. Yes, true. Because the specialist does the research. They, they look at the risk. They look at it more holistically. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's what the survey is there for. It's for investigating more detail. Right, and then there's your note about Sasria. Okay, we saw it earlier. Here's the note about it. 
At renewal, is Sasria included by default? Yes. No. No, no, no. You have to choose it, sorry. Yes. It's not automatically provided. It's something that you specifically need to include as part of the policy. Okay. And it, it's, it's, it's for other policies as well. So, for example, um, okay, you guys uh, are, um, are... Are you guys in a complex or are you guys a freestanding house? Freestanding house. Freestanding house. Okay, so then um, Sastria would actually be part of your contract with the insurer for your house. But it, it applies to anything. Contracts for complexes, contracts for buildings, for commercial uh, purposes and others as well. It's something that needs to be specifically included um, for those um, riots or civil type of destruction. Okay, and we know in a place like South Africa, uh, we see riots and strikes often. I mean, think about it. Would, would you want Sasria on your cover if you're in, in Limpopo? Uh, yes. Yes, because every now and again we hear the schools being burned down. Yes. Okay, and we hear public, public buildings being burnt down and public, public infrastructure being torched and damaged. Okay, so there, Sasha would definitely be something that they would have to consider including on those policies. Okay, yes. to at least have cover to try build or rebuild um, those those um, those items. Okay, those uh, those facilities. Okay. Right, okay. and the request must be in writing, and Sasria will not backdate cover, okay, for more than six months. So if you haven't included it, you can't backdate it. Okay, it needs okay. to be included, and, and it's forward-looking. Okay. Okay, right, and that's Sasria. Well, then just a note about the renewal. Renewal negotiations discussions are, are done ahead. We know that. We spoke about that. Okay, remember, you have as much leverage as your insurer to negotiate and to discuss. Okay, so don't ever feel that just because you're the insured and you're dealing with these large corporates or big companies that you don't have any say. You as the client always have say. Right, because remember, at the end of the day, the client makes up the business. Right, and, yes. and it's very competitive. So in insurance, in the insurance industry, all the insurers want the best clients. And that's why you have these fancy marketing campaigns where they, if you, they even give you something if they can't beat the quote and all of that. Okay. Okay, they do all of that marketing because they want the best clients. Okay. okay. Clients for an insurer is everything because what do the insurers do? They pool, the pooling. Yes. Okay, so the better the pool, the better the company. Right, and that's why it's competitive. They tr they're trying to poach clients. Okay, so one company wants to poach clients from another company, and that company wants to poach clients from another company. Right, and the reason for that is the pool. They want the pool to be as big as possible, and they want the pool to be as high a quality as possible as well. Right, so you want the best clients on your book. Okay. Okay, and that's with the renewal. So insurers look at including something like this automatic inflation margins why because it helps keep clients on their book for longer okay because think about it if you're going to have a client that has an automatic inflation margin and if they accept it are they your client for a longer period of time yes yes okay so sometimes they can have something like this where it helps both parties because it's also peace of mind for the for the client because think about it irrespective of your risk level if your risk level changes okay at least you know you still got cover because they've included this automatic inflation margin okay so underwriters uh, will assist insurers with the actual rates okay so if, if you if you accept that okay before renewal if the client accepts the automatic inflation then that's great because now you can give the client a policy for five years instead of a policy for each year Yes. Okay. All right. And I think this is the last bit. Okay. Second last bit. A broker. We spoke about this churning. What is churning? Churning. I mentioned it before. Um. With brokers. How do brokers get paid? <coughs> Commission. Exactly. 
Okay, so what did we say is going to happen a lot in the short-term industry? Mm. Company A and B, right? Yes. And then we've got a customer. Can the customer go to company A for short-term cover? No, it has to go to company B. No, yeah, the, the person can go to any company they want. Yeah. Do you agree? Okay, but now, what happens if the customer is already with A? And now, the broker is going to move them to B, but they're not going to change the premium, and they're not going to change the cover. They're just moving A to B. Is that in the best interest of the customer? Uh, it's the best interest of the insurer. Of the broker. Broker, yes. Okay, so be careful. So... Churning, beware of churning. Churning is looking at when you take someone from one insurer, okay, and then we move them to another insurer. Okay, so here's the example. This is an example of a bad broker. Okay, so if your broker had to come to you and say, well, your policy is coming up for renewal, okay, um, A is providing you with a certain premium and a certain amount of cover. Okay, okay. Um, then they're going to say, well, let's change to B because B is maybe a bigger company, right, than A. Right, they're a bigger company than A, but they're changing your policy, but they're giving you the same premium and they're giving you the same cover. So what was their reason for changing you from A to B? It would be for their benefit. It was to get paid commission twice. Yes. Okay, see, that's okay. not allowed. That's bad. Okay, brokers will get into trouble for doing that because they're churning policy. They're taking someone from one company to go to the next just for the sake of commission. Okay. Right. But if the broker is suggesting a better policy or better benefits or better premiums, then that's in the interest of the client, not the interest of the broker. Mm. Okay, and that's fine. Right, because then you're doing your client a better service by offering them more with a different provider. Okay, so if they're taking you from provider A, okay, to B, and with reasons why you should do so, then that's good. If they're reducing your premium and increasing your benefit, then that's great. Okay. Okay, if they're not, then that's a problem. Okay, so brokers act as what? Um. communication line exactly because do we always understand what's written in those contracts no <laughs> no sometimes those contracts are so complicated that you need someone to help you interpret and navigate that okay yeah and that's the role of the broker they should be the ones informing you and educating you as the client to make sure you know exactly what you're getting right because brokers should be giving you the best products as long as they're independent Okay, so okay. the best brokers that you should be looking at are generally the ones that are more independent because they generally should be providing you with the best advice. Okay, normally if you go to brokers with specific providers, then they're trying to sell you those specific providers' products. Yes. Okay, which might not always be the best ones on the market. Okay, mm. so there's always, there's always positives and negatives. Okay, not, not all independent brokers are the best. There are sometimes brokers that also don't always provide the best advice, but it depends on the client's needs. Okay, it needs to be specific to their requirements. Okay. okay. What is the insured? We spoke about them before. You should have a good idea of what that is. The insured is me. Correct. The insured is the client that's taking out cover. Perfect. And if I'm looking at renewal, when do you have to pay your renewal by if you're an individual? By the first of every month. No, if you're an individual. Well, yeah. that's if you're a good individual. But if you if you miss that date, is there a grace period? Um, is it two weeks? It was 15 days. Remember we saw 15 days grace yes, period? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, there's a 15 day grace period with, in, with, with premiums. Grace period. Okay. Okay, 15 day grace period in terms of the renewal. 15 days. Right, and that's it, Melanie. We've come to the end of that bit. Okay, so 
Six, I'm going to start next time. Okay, short-term reinsurance. We'll look at that in more detail um, then. Okay, this one is quite long because this one covers some calculations. Okay, you'll see I'm going to talk about calculating different surpluses in terms of the amount that we can place with a provider in terms of insurance. Because remember, reinsurance is what? Uh, when the insurer gets insured. When, in, right. when the insurer gets insured, yes, because the insurer is going to be transferring risk to the insurance in the form of reinsurance. Yes. Yeah, okay, very good. You remember the definition. Okay, great. Okay. So, all right, so I'm going to stop here for this week. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on with Study Unit 6 next week um, when we look at a new section. Okay, so the sections we've looked at today have been mainly focusing on the insured and the insurer. We've, look, we've been looking at both. Right, yes. next week, when we look at reinsurance, we're focusing on the insurer, not the insured. Okay, because the insurer is the company with the most risk because they're going to be transferring risk from the client to them. Okay. Okay. All right. You got any questions about this week's sections? No, no, okay. nothing.